There's an internet meme that I really like. It's a picture of Miles Davis, and there's a quote that's attributed to Miles. The quote is, it's not the note you play that's the wrong note. It's the note you play after that makes that note right or wrong. Now this being a quote off the internet, I have no idea if Miles Davis ever actually said that. <laughs> But Herbie Hancock tells a story that I think supports this quote. See, Herbie played in Miles' band back in the early 60s. And one night, at a gig in Germany, they were playing the song, So What? And in the middle of the song, Herbie played the wrong chord. He said it was so bad, he picked his hands up off the keyboards and he put them over his ears. <laughs> Miles paused for just a breath, and he played this fill of notes that made that chord right. And I like this story even better than the quote, because it illustrates the relationship between Herbie and Miles, and between Miles and the music. See, Herbie was really, really young, just starting out his career. Miles was well-established. Miles was already a legend. Miles could have done anything he wanted to do. He could have stopped the performance said, hey, take it from the top. Let's get it right this time. Could have humiliated Herbie, maybe even wrecked his early, early budding career. Miles didn't do that. Miles could have just kept playing the song as it was supposed to be played, as Miles had written the song to be played. But the audience knew something was wrong. The band certainly did. Miles didn't do that. Miles took what Herbie played not as a mistake, but as an opportunity to create something new and different. And that is the mark of a master of improvisation. We all improvise, all of you, every day. None of us wake up with a script each day that tells us exactly what we're going to say, exactly what we're going to do, who we're going to meet, where we're going to go. And yet, every day, my brain tries to write that script, constantly. And I do improv. <laughs> I've been doing live improv performances since 2011. I got my start, I went to a workshop, and we did these games and exercises, and I had a blast. And I thought, if I could learn how to do improv, then I could be funny. <laughs> I was quickly disabused of this notion. <laughs> you see, improv is not about being funny. Improv is about listening. It's about being present. It's about accepting. And if I can do these things, if I can listen, be present, and accept, then I can help my scene partner create a scene. And that scene will be funny. Usually. <laughs> now, there are rules to improv. How weird is that? How can there be rules to something you just make up on the fly? But there are. Don't deny. Make your scene partner look good. Avoid asking questions. Use details. Create a physical environment and play within it. And for God's sake, don't try to be funny. Now, I'm not up here to give you a class in improvisational acting, although I recommend you take one. I'm here to talk about the first rule of improv, yes and. So yes and is the core of improv, and at its most basic, it means that as an improviser, my job is to yes, agree to what was just said or done on stage, then and, add more information to the scene. For instance, it's grandma's 97th birthday this weekend. Yes, and I got her the pony she's always wanted. <laughs> Most beginning improvisers are so trained, including me when I first started out. We are so trained to respond with yes and that we will literally say the words before every line. It makes for some really stilted scene conversations. <laughs> but more importantly, if all we're doing is parroting, then we're not really grasping the meaning of yes and. See, the yes of yes and is not 
just dumb, blind acceptance. Or excuse me, not just dumb, blind agreement, it's acceptance. <laughs> Y'all accept me, right? Good. It is, it's acceptance. It's the acceptance of the reality of a scene as it's being created on stage. If my partner refers to me as their father, then I am their father. If they refer to me as their mother, then why, yes, I am their mother. It's my responsibility to take that now truth of the scene and move it forward and not deny. Because if I deny that reality, I leave my scene partner out to hang. They now have to struggle to figure out what comes next in a scene that's already broken. If I deny the reality of someone offstage in real life, I'm creating a situation that has one of two outcomes. I either force them to reframe their reality to one that I see fit, that one that I deem appropriate, or conflict. The former, Forcing that reframing, that's dehumanizing. It's a power play. It's saying your reality doesn't matter, at least not as much as mine does. The latter conflict, well, it results in the loss of understanding, even the potential for understanding. If all we're doing is shouting each other's points of view, our own realities to the other, we're not in debate, we're not in dialogue, we're, we're just shouting. When I'm able to accept another person's reality, then I can learn. Then I can communicate. I don't have to agree with them. It's my job to open myself up, to become vulnerable, and accept that point of view. I've learned through improv to pause, to breathe, when I'm confronted by a point of view I reflexively want to deny. I allow myself the space and the grace to accept, to consider. And if I can do that, and it's scary, then I can form a bond with that person. And we do that enough, and we form a community. One of the things I really struggled with when I was first starting out, was coming to the stage, coming into a scene, already having written the entire scene. I just, based on the audience, excuse me, the audience suggestion or a random thought I had on the way to the theater that day, I would have scripted this entire thing and oh, it was going to be hilarious. It never worked. You know why? My scene partner was too dumb <laughs> to read my mind <laughs> and understand what they were supposed to do to make all of this stuff work. It was extraordinarily frustrating. Over the years, I have learned, I've had to learn, how to empty my mind before and during a scene. Instead of coming to the stage with a preconceived, pre-deceived notion of what a scene should be, I simply be present. I listen to that opening suggestion or line. I look at my scene partner to see how they're standing. What is their body language telling me? I reach out to the audience to know what kind of vibe, what are you responding to? I delve into myself, to understand the emotions and the energy that I am bringing to the stage. I strive to be as present as possible. When I can empty myself out like that, the scene flows, it flows through me. I don't have to work. When my scene partner does it too, it's incredible when that happens. I can't explain it. In, in improv, we call it group mind. When it happens, it's magic. Nothing can go wrong. It's effortless, it's egoless, it's incredible to watch, and it is more incredible to perform. When I'm able to empty myself in life, life 
flows. There are tragedies. There are celebrations. There are good things. There are bad things. If I attach expectations to those things, it's frustrating. If I can release those and let life flow through me, I have contentment and peace. In Christian theology, there's the concept of kenosis, which is the emptying of the self to allow the Holy Spirit to come in. In Sufism, they have fana, which is to die before one dies. In Liu Shushin's book, The Three-Body Problem, he quotes a Buddhist abbot saying, emptiness is not nothingness. Emptiness is a type of existence. You must use this existential emptiness to fill yourself. And this, this is the kind of emptiness I'm talking about. It's not a denial of self. It's a release of the ego. It's a release of the expectation. And when I can do this, when I can empty myself, and it is hard, then, then I can say yes. The and of yes and is action. One thing I still struggle with all these years later is I want to respond to an offer with the best response I can come up with. An offer is one of those lines that an improviser throws out that's just begging to be picked up and run with, right? So if my scene partner said, that's the last time I run a marathon backwards, <laughs> there's a lot for me to work with there. <laughs> I mean, how many times have they run a marathon? Do they always run it backwards, or was it just this one time? Were they the only one running backwards, or was everybody else running backwards too? Why is this the last time they're going to run it backwards? What happened today that made it bad? Did they hurt themselves? Was I supposed to be there? Did they win? <laughs> Which one of those responses is the best? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. As long as I have accepted, as long as I have yesed, it doesn't matter as long as I act. Think back to the story about Miles and Herbie. If Miles had simply accepted what Herbie had played, well, that's nice and all. But without Miles acting, playing that fill of notes that made that wrong chord right, well, then Herbie's mistake would have always and forevermore been a mistake. It's wonderful when we are able to be fully present and actively listen to someone's struggles, to someone's pain. It's supportive, it's healing, it's bonding when we can be with that person. And sometimes that's all that's needed. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes there needs to be action. So. I want each of you to pick a day in the next month and make it your personal yes and day. I want you to intentionally yes and every interaction you have that day. <laughs> now remember, remember, yes and does not mean you just agree to everything that's asked of you. Otherwise, the kids are going to ask for, to borrow the car and have a raging party. <laughs> Don't do that. No, listen. Be wholly present in the moment. Drop those expectations. Accept that point of view that you struggle with. And then act. Thank you.